and welcome to the Books on Asia podcast, sponsored by Stonebridge Press, publisher of fine books on Asia for over 30 years, located at www.stonebridge.com. And I'm your host, Amy Chavez. Today, we have with us a very special guest, Stephen Mansfield, a British writer and photojournalist based in Japan. His photojournalism work has appeared in over 60 publications around the world, including CNN Travel, Nikkei Asia, and the Kyoto Journal. He has published 20 books, four on the culture and people of Laos, several on Japanese gardens, and he has an essay in the anthology Inaka, Portraits of Rural Japan. But today, he's going to talk to us about Tokyo, a biography, his book that came out with Tuttle Publishing. So welcome, Stephen. Thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to have you on the show. I was wondering if we could start off with you telling us a little bit about the background of Tokyo, a biography. How did the idea of this book come up? Is it something that you've always wanted to write? Well, there was no, I don't think there was a, a single point of genesis. I think there were various um, strands I live on the outskirts of Tokyo. I can't really call it Tokyo, uh, Funabashi, but obviously having um, the world's biggest city on your doorstep is, is a constant stimulation. I read everything I could get my hands on on the subject of Tokyo and began to form my own uh, ideas and uh, the, the basis for some kind of interpretation of Tokyo. But I think uh, as far as text and writing goes, I, um, I started to contribute to a magazine called Tokyo Journal mm -hmm. back in, oh, it would have been about 1999, I think. I did a series for them, which continued for about three years. It was called Tokyo Faces, where I profiled different areas of the city, obvious areas like Asakusa and, and Ginza, but also some off the beaten track areas like <clears throat> Tamanoi and so on. That sort of got me writing about the city, really, uh, which I hadn't done before. And then that was followed up by a similar format for a magazine called the Japan Journal, which I contributed a monthly article for a couple of years on, again, areas or quarters. Um, but it was looking at the areas through the sort of filter of Japanese writers, how they perceive the area. And um, it was basically a, a set of quotations from different writers. And then I started to think about a book. Yeah, that was the starting point, I think. Yeah, and then I approached a publisher. And the book was in, I think it was 2016. Yeah. Absolutely. And is the publisher the same title then? Tuttle. Is the same publisher you started with? Okay, right. right. Well, it's interesting because you said you read everything you could on the subject, and there certainly is a comprehensive bibliography at the end, as well as filmography, which I thought was really nice and a nice index. Filmography is always obviously very difficult to keep up to date because since writing this book, there have been so many films set in Tokyo. And just a little back, sorry, backtrack a little bit on the origins of my thoughts on writing this book. One of the other things that I did before doing this particular book was to write a, a book called uh, Tokyo, a uh, cultural and literary history. And as the title suggests, it was looking at the city through its literature and, and culture. And that's uh, the research I did on that was invaluable for the book under discussion now. I can imagine. I've noticed that a lot of these histories of uh, cities and such are getting shorter. And I wonder if that's not because of all the tourism we have now coming, people coming to Japan from other countries, and they want to pick up something, they're not necessarily interested in, you know, all the details, but want a nice overview. And your book certainly fulfills that role. And it's very uh, fast paced. And the, the writing's very lively. And so you don't feel like you're reading a history book. And you have a lot of experience in the city, which to me really made the book different from others. You're not necessarily just reporting things, but you're also adding some more, a little more depth. And there were a few aha moments I had when I read your book. And one was when you were talking about how Tokyo, it's divided into all these different neighborhoods. You've got Shinjuku, you've got Ginza, you've got Omotesando, all these different neighborhoods. 
And they're, that's usually how it's reported. Well, Tokyo is divided up into, but what you added, which was really helpful, and maybe that comes from the background you just told me about writing some of these articles about parts of Tokyo from the Japanese perspective, is that the Japanese people themselves, they identify with their neighborhood more than Tokyo as a whole. Mm -hmm. So someone who lives in Ginza might never even step foot in the eastern side. Yes, I think it was based on first-hand experience. And as you say, looking at the city partially, but also looking at it from an overview, seeing the city more as narrative than history, um, and the writing more as interpretation than reporting, let's say. So um, I don't make any claims to originality in the book, but I think I did try Tokyo a biography, I called it, because it was based on the London the biography. But I used a uh, because I wanted to sort of keep the idea open that somebody else might come along and, you know, perhaps write a better book. One of the reasons that I wrote the book was because I thought a city of, of this magnitude and importance is actually very little written in historical um, format on the city. We've got, obviously, Seidenstecker's two books, The Low City, High City, these ones here, and Tokyo Rising, which are classics, wonderful. But they actually end in 1857 or 1867, <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> Don't cover the modern period there. Yeah, that was what I was trying to do, sort of cover the, the pre-development period when the city was basically a marsh, marshland, to what, it, what we see today, which is a sort of urban marshland. And can you explain uh, to our listeners the concept of high city, low city, which I think Seidensticker, you know, his books are really all about that. But it is a basic concept that if you understand, it helps you conceptualize the city and how it's been developed yeah, I think the original city was actually very well planned. I mean, it was an extremely well planned city. I saw, went to an exhibition a few years ago, a photo exhibition, at an Italian photographer who'd been in Japan in the mid 1850s before the city was um, let free, basically, <laughs> to develop in any way it wanted. But there was a particular one I, that struck me, it was taken on a, a Tago Hill which is where Atago Shrine, Atago Ginger is now. And it showed this very ordered city. And you see the inner city, which is where the, the, power, the centers of power, really, where the, the shogun and, he, and the samurai lived and the, the daimyo, the feudal lords. You had a sort of series of rings, really, coming out from the, the circular moats and then going into artisan, craftspeople, merchant quarters. So you had the sort of centralized government and power, the military, this sort of de facto capital in the center, and then the sort of working class areas. And then you had the high, in the higher grounds, the estates of the, these very vast, spacious estates where the wealthy daimyo lords lived. Essentially, you had uh, three cities, a sort of administrative city, a uh, military city, a center of power. And then you had the low city, which was literally developed on the lowlands, which were the poorer areas that were much more difficult to develop because the quality of the land itself was not particularly good. The land was susceptible to flooding, tidal waves, and all, all sorts of other unpredictables. And then you had the upper ground, which was the more desirable area where the wealthier, as I say, the aristocrats basically lived. So you had the, the low city and the high city, the the working class, um, and then the more affluent, salubrious city. Today, I, obviously, it's not quite the same, but I think you can still still see the same division, the same diachotomy. But now I would sort of describe it as more like the sort of high-income city and the low-income city. <laughs> it's, it's more a sort of economic divide, but it's, it's open to everybody, of course. You, you don't have to... There's no trespassing onto the, the, the high city. What are the neighborhoods in the low city? Well, you've got the northeast, where, uh, north of uh, Saxa, where you, Taito Ward, for example, it would be part of the low city. And then you've got all the 
areas um, in the east, uh, Mukojima, those uh, Sumida Ward, all those areas, Koto Ward, virtually the same as before, but larger and more intense. But you can see a, a division here, and also a property values, land values are quite different. I remember walking not that long ago in Sendagi, which is uh, part of Bunkyo Ward, which means culture ward. And the prices, the houses there are spacious, they have private gardens, and it is a salubrious area. But then you literally cross the road, Shinobazu no Dori, and you're in Taitoku, Taito Ward, and the prices plummet. But you're literally 50 meters. Uh, division there. The zoning hasn't changed, essentially. And I also wanted to talk a little bit about the Olympics, both of them, because you can't really not talk about the Tokyo Olympics in the 60s. Uh, 62, was it? 64. Because it was such a, an integral part of the development of Tokyo. It was uh, right after the occupation, the U.S. occupation, and Japan was rushing to show the world how much you know, they had risen from the ashes. They were a modern city, modern country, and that things were moving ahead. So that's always a very interesting part of the Tokyo's history. On the other hand, as you brought up in your book, because it was, you know, a rush to get things done. Perhaps some of the planning wasn't quite as good as it could have been. And then again, we had the 2020 Olympics in Tokyo. And it was so sad because the rest of the world couldn't experience Tokyo, even though we were ready. But because of the pandemic, everyone could only watch it online. So I was wondering how in your opinion, how did that planning go? And how, how did they do? Did they do a pretty good job with that? Well, it, it is interesting comparing the two events. I mean, the, the first one, the 1964 event from the Japanese point of view was a resounding success. As you said, it, it wasn't just a sporting event. It was Japan's re-entry into the international community after the period of American occupation. Whereas the second one, the, the more recent one, was more of a compromise, I think, really. I think people were very excited about the first one, really, because their country, their city, their capital was in the spotlight. It also involved rebuilding of the city, so a facelift for the city. So it was a transformation, really, of Tokyo. The second one wasn't. It was really, as I say, a compromise. It could either be described as a failure or a noble failure, I think, in terms of what they achieved. I found my attention span lapsing, like a lot of Japanese people during the event. Instead of hearing the sort of resounding roar of the crowd, I just heard a hollow echo from the stadiums. I think they did a an amazing job of actually staging these events so that so that athletes didn't have to wait another four years another three or four years to reapply for the olympics but i think um in terms of a spectacle it was a very reduced event yeah very a very muted event and the public as you no, I'm sure from reading there were protests against the cost of the Olympic events in the, really since Los Angeles, I guess, have, have escalated. Um, but this one was the, the most costly of all events. I think it, my last reading of that was uh, three to four times more than the original estimate. So it was phenomenally expensive. And uh, the city has gone into debt accordingly. But it was... It was doggedly determined to hold these Olympics. And in a sense, it was a kind of noble and courageous effort to stage this uh, massive event. You know. Do you think that Japan will win the bid for Sapporo, the Winter Olympics? <laughs> it's kind of haunted by um, scandals mm -hmm. and <laughs> lots of other things. So Very much so, as it seems to be. Scandal seems to follow the Olympics anyway these days. Uh, so many things are always covered. And I mean, I think the first Olympics, if you, you know, read very, if you read Robert Whiting's book, for example, on Tokyo Junkie, recent book on Tokyo, he was there during the Olympics. And uh, I've spoken to other people who were in Tokyo at the time. And there was a dark side to the original Olympics, I think, you know, in the sense that um, 
the city was transformed, but not necessarily improved. I think um, one of the things I mentioned in the book was that it was pre-Olympics. The, the city was, was very much a canal city. It was a city that, um, you know, like Bangkok used to be perhaps rather exaggeratedly called the Venice of the East. <laughs> But there was some truth in that, um, you know, particularly in the summer months when the city is so humid, it was probably very pleasant to saunter along the banks of canals and, you know, enjoy the currents of air coming through the city. Most of those were occluded by overhead um, expressways, <laughs> historical buildings, uh, heritage buildings. Nihonbashi. Nihonbashi, oh. yes. <laughs> Prime Minister Koizumi launched the idea of perhaps putting that underground, which would be phenomenally expensive, running it underneath the river. But, uh, yeah, things like that. Um, I also mentioned the 200,000 dogs were exterminated, wild dogs. These days, there would probably be animal rights groups up in arms on something like that. At that time, all of that was brushed under the carpet. All kinds of odd signs that were put up, like no urinating during the Olympics on the streets and things like this. Um, there, were, there were some odd things going on. But overall, it, it was a triumph for, for the Japanese in, the, in a way that the, the recent one perhaps was not. Another thing you say in your book, which was quite surprising to me, certainly I believe it, uh, you said that in London, for example, 30% of the city is allotted for parks. And in Japan, it's only 5% in Tokyo. And I thought about that in Tokyo is so hot. And global warming is such a problem. And I always wonder why they don't do more green. And just as an example, I mean, it's a mindset. I don't think it really has so much to do with logic. And as an example, in the small island where I live, they put in a new ticket office, ferry ticket office. And all around it, they put, they just paved it. And I understand it's cheap and it's easy and low maintenance, but we don't have cars on the island, so it doesn't need to be a parking area. And you walk to the ticket office in the summer, it's so hot. And it's just that, you know, sun, that heat radiates up. And I said to them, I said, you know, why don't we put in a few trees, just, you know, a little shrubbery garden of some sort, because a lot of places in Japan do. You have a little Japanese garden, the suggestion of a garden, right? And people were just like, ah, oh, yeah, whatever. And so what what do you think it is that people don't try to bring a little more, not just green, but coolness to the hot city? It's such a stifling place in the summertime. I don't really have a, a clear answer or a good answer to that. I mean, I think obviously land prices come into it. But, you know, New York is expensive, isn't it? Property in London. I think it's also the the sort of missed opportunities. I mean, when you had the, the 1923 earthquake or then the uh, the bombing of the carpet bombing of tokyo you did have a chance there to rebuild the city in ways that would have been much more green or eco friendly but they were not taken it was a hasty scrambling for you know leases and land ownership came into kicked in i think it's just the when land becomes available in Tokyo, it's very quickly snapped up by construction companies who have very little interest in greening the city. Yes. Mm -hmm. But as you say, there are other ways of doing it. I mean, um, roof gardens. You don't see many roof gardens in Tokyo. A lot of talk about that, but very little uh, evidence of that. I think some of the waterways could be greener as well, the, the existing canals, the, the river system, because... Uh, like Hiroshima, it's a bit of a delta, really. But at the same time, of course, you've got a city that the government is imploring people to relocate outside the city, but people are pouring in. So the population is constantly <laughs> going up. Despite Japan's overall population, you know, declining, the t population of Tokyo is increasing. It's incredible. I wanted to ask you about your afterword, which I really, really loved in the book. I think that's some of your best writing, and you really a lot of your know-how comes into some of your, I don't want to say predictions, but ideas mm. on Tokyo in the future. We all know there's going to be a big earthquake at some point. 
We don't know when your description of what would actually happen in an earthquake it was just really eye-opening. I guess I hadn't really thought of it to that extent. And of course, we have this capital city and everything's in Tokyo. Like, you know, mm. all of the politicians are in Tokyo and all of the scholars and the researchers and all of that. So I was wondering if you could um, elaborate on what you think about the city of the future. Mm. The afterword is, is, is different, isn't it, from the rest of the book, because the rest of the book is based on concrete research, really, whereas the afterword is really quite speculative. So uh, it's really based on my own sort of observations and projections. But, um, I mean, yes, on, on reflection, I mean, earthquakes, of course, earthquakes don't destroy entire cities, <laughs> I think the 1923 one perhaps um, almost did because the the city city was essentially a wooden city like the great fire of london really it spread very quickly through the city because everything was made of wood but this time i suppose it would be partial destruction you would have certain areas of the city that would be wiped out other areas would survive but that, that that's one of the aspects that I talk about there, the lack of preparedness, I think, in Tokyo for such an event. There's really no plan A. There are lots of plan Bs, but there's really no plan A for the, the city. They hold these simulated events every September where you get into a truck and experience an earthquake. Most people have already experienced several earthquakes anyway. <laughs> these are sort of magnitude nine earthquakes, but whether they actually help you deal in reality with an earthquake or not is another question. But that is something that Tokyo will have to face. You know, talk of decentralization for years have not come to fruition. Um, other things I talk about in the afterword is the way that the city is becoming a subterranean city because of the lack of space. It's going underground, which appears to make sense, but the actual earth crust of Tokyo is, is becoming increasingly friable as the weight of buildings has increased. And, um, you know, the boring of tunnels, in, immense numbers of tunnels, many of them running very close to each other, so the subway system, the, the metro. So you've got a very unstable basis, increasingly unstable basis for building a subterranean city. I don't think that's necessarily any more realistic than um, Tange Kenzo's city in the air above Tokyo Bay, which never happened, of course. It was a, a blueprint. The other thing I mentioned is the city becoming more, much more polyglot, becoming more multi-ethnic, although a lot of Japanese people don't seem to recognize what's happening in front of them. But it is becoming a true multi-ethnic city, and I think that's something that's going to increase. I think myself it's a good thing. I think it, it will create more interest and diversity. It does have its uh, the dangers, of course. I mean, we're already seeing sort of ghetto-like zones, I think, in the city. You've got, you know, Edo Gawa, which is uh, the ward where Indians tend to gravitate. You've got Shin Okubo, which is well known for Korean community, Ikebukuro, Chinese people. These are replications of little com communities that exist all over the world where people of, the, of similar nationality form support groups. And in a sense, they're, they're very sensible and pragmatic. But of course, it does it tend to lead to isolated little zones within the city. That's something I've touch on in the book as well. Mm. I loved your line where you said, Tokyo is a very cosmopolitan city, but the people themselves are not very cosmopolitan. No, it's an international city, but it's not a, a cosmopolitan <laughs> city. Yeah, in that sense, yeah. <laughs> right. So as a photojournalist, I'm interested in hearing your ideas and thoughts on the photos for the book and how you came up with those. Yes, uh, nobody would know I took any of the photos here. They're not acknowledged <laughs> in the book. It's surprising. Um, in the chapters, each chapter starts with a black and white photograph, which is not mine. This was chosen by the, the publishing company. The central photos are 
essentially mine color photos. Um, most of them are what I call data photos. They, they carry information. They're not necessarily composi interesting compositions. The photos were supplemented by postcards. I spent a long time collect several years collecting postcards from flea markets, and they don't have any copyright, so that was good. I, I photographed the postcards, included those in the book. The oldest one is from 1912. It shows a picture of people praying in front of a portrait of the Meiji Emperor. doesn't make much sense to anybody today looking at that, but what in fact is happening is that the, the emperor is dying in the palace and they're praying for his recovery. That was the oldest one, but they go up, they show various things, um, celebration of new architecture, the, the first subway, the Ginza line, pictures from the aftermath of the earthquake. Now that was interesting for me that the, I mean, postcards in Britain are basically just um, picturesque images of um, landscapes and seaside towns, and some of them are comical. In Japan at that time, they're almost like documentaries. They photographed um, things that had happened. So I've got a picture, for example, of um, a family, boat people essentially, living on a canal off the Sumida River. There were a lot of boat people at that time who worked on the coal boats bringing coal into the city but they actually lived on the families lived on boats when i was collecting these some of the postcards were quite horrific you had mounds of dead bodies after the earthquakes and things i didn't collect those postcards myself but some of them were quite shocking but the very realistic views of tokyo a couple of pictures were from donald rich's collection of images. There was one of the Hibiya crossing in 1948. He allowed me to photograph um, uh, as many of his prints as I wanted and, and use them freely. So I did in this book. There's another one of his, which he took of the Black Market in the Ginza in 1948. It's very Tony area now. There we have all the the pots and pans on the, the table and stalls and people selling their used kimonos and things. So that, those were the main sources for the imagery. I also used a couple of my original ukiyo-e prints as well. I have the ebook version. You sent me, of course, the print version as well. But when I read it, I read it on the ebook version. But there were quite a lot of photos. It was very interesting. I liked uh, how you did both the Tokyo Tower and the uh, the new Tokyo Sky Tree. Mm. Also, I just want to ask you very briefly, but because I'm so interested, your books on Laos. Oh yeah. And what's your connection to Laos? Well, yes, it's going back a bit. Like a lot of people, I was very in, of my sort of generation. I was very interested in the Vietnam War. I wasn't uh, perhaps old enough to know exactly what was going on at the time, although I did at the age of 14 or 15, I did go on a, a few demos in London, in Grosvenor Square, which was where the um, American embassy was. And I saw things that I'd never seen before, people throwing Molotov cocktails and uh, political agitators in the, the crowd, really working people's emotions up. But of course, when you're talking about the Vietnam War, it's not just Vietnam, it's Cambodia and Laos. So I was um, forming a picture of those countries, Indochina, and had read quite a, a bit about it. And then when the country opened for visitors, for tourism, basically, in the uh, very early 90s, I think, they the started issuing visas for people. People had been able, uh, visitors had been able to go there at an earlier stage. I remember talking to John Dougal, the writer, and he said that he'd been in Luan Prabhan in 1976 or something. But um, I felt that I was a fairly early visitor there in 1991 and found the, the country, it was, it was a bit of a time slip, the country it hadn't really developed much. As I traveled around the country, um, I wrote over 100 articles, had over 100 articles published on Laos in those early years. I think it's a bit like a snow, it's a bit like having a, a photo exhibition. One photo doesn't make an exhibition, but when you have a collection, you start to see that something is forming here. It's like a snowdrift. It starts to form into something, take shape. 
and I started to feel that, well, perhaps I had enough um, visual material and uh, uh, enough um, text commentary to write a book. So um, I approached a lot of publishers, I mean, over 30 publishers, and um, they got back to me and with with questions like, where is La- Lagos? <laughs> um, no, not, not Lagos. Lagos. <laughs> <laughs> There's a very limited amount of knowledge about the country. Anyway, a series of rejections. Uh, finally, um, a publisher called Ellsworth Books, owned by a, an American guy, came out in, I think it was 1997. There were no books on Laos. It was a, a book that was brought out by a Russian publisher, and that was about it. Uh, um, there were no illustrated books on Laos so that 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 came out and that sort of led to other books I wrote a book called um, Culture Shock Laos which is in that series. Ah that's a series right. Mm-hmm. And well, I wrote a children's book which was just sort of um, an introduction to the country so I did a lot of work on that country it became a kind of passion <laughs> I guess to to write about it but then I wouldn't say I lost interest in the country but when um it had a very high, uh, if you wanted to get into the country at that time, you had to pay $200 for a visa, which was very expensive. That time was very expensive, yeah. yeah. It was almost like a means test. So people like backpackers really couldn't afford to go there. But when they reduced the fee to $16, the, the country was flooded with visitors, <laughs> and uh, my interests moved on. <laughs> I see, yeah, okay. And we have to wrap up here. But I, the last question I always ask our guests is what their f- three favorite books on Japan are. And I know it's really hard to narrow it down to three, but I would love to hear what you have enjoyed over the years. Yeah, but actually, yeah, very, very difficult. Uh, thanks for giving me that question a head, uh, a head up to think about it. The first one is this one, The Art of Setting Stones. I don't know if you know this book. It's by... Mm-hmm. I do. It's called And Other Writings from the Japanese Garden, Mark Peter Keane, who I actually met for the first time this August. Um, Isn't that a Stonebridge Press book? It's a Stonebridge Press yep. book. That's yeah, right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I have a copy. It's a wonderful book. And I met him in August because he designed the gardens for a new hotel, which is open in Kyoto, called the, the Genji Hotel. It's a fantastic, it's a wonderful boutique hotel. Um, each each room has a little court, small, very small courtyard garden, which he designed. This book I really like because um, I've read a lot of books on Japanese gardens, um, but this one is not really just about the Japanese garden. It's about life and death and relationships. It's about beauty. It's about Japanese aesthetics. He uses the garden as a a starting point, really, launching pad for discussing all kinds of important topics. So um, I thought that was a very unique book. The other one that I reviewed this book, The uh, the Pine Islands by the German writer Marion Poschmann. It's a short book, but it was, uh, it was shortlisted for the uh, Man Booker International Prize 2000. 19 wow. and it's a kind of it's a picaresque novel it's short but it's a journey through japan um i won't tell you the the story but um uh, provide any spoilers but it's extremely well written and um she actually spent several months in kyoto um, studying japanese aesthetics on a gerte scholarship and um i interviewed her for the um uh, Kyoto Journal. We talked about Japanese gardens, and um, it was an interesting exchange. But this is extremely well written. The third choice is an unusual one. It's um, a manga by Yoshihiro Tatsumi, who is not that well known in Japan. But is uh, it, it's like a, you, know, you talk about writers, writers. <laughs> this is somebody who you know people who really appreciate good quality manga. This is called a Drifting Life. It's an incredibly realistic look at life in Japan in the post-war period. There's nothing sentimental about this. It's a very, very raw, honest book. And it has some you know, very unflattering kind of pictures in, in the book itself. But a, a wonderful piece, a story. It's about his life. I think it's a kind of autobiography. There's a wonderful picture there. I'm just showing Amy of the protest movement on the diet building in 
So mm-hmm. I, I'm not a big manga fan, but I was really uh, taken with that book. And he's written a lot of uh, very realistic books. There's another one called Abandon the Old in Tokyo. <laughs> it's very, again, <laughs> very <laughs> Interesting. Okay, well, thank you so much. Those are interesting books. I'll have to, you know, pick up some and check them out as well. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for coming on to the show, and I can't wait for your next book. Are you working on anything? Yes, I'm working on a, a book for a British publisher called Thames and Hudson. It will be a book on j- uh, modern Japanese garden design from 1900 to the present. It's a two-year project, so I'll be busy. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Well, we look forward to it. And be sure to pick up uh, Stephen Mansfield's book, Tokyo A Biography, available at all good bookstores. And uh, we'll be talking to you soon, hopefully when your next book comes out. Thanks, Stephen. Thank you very much, Amy. You've been listening to the Books on Asia podcast, produced and edited by Amy Chavez and Michael Palmer. Logo by Alex Kerr. The Books on Asia podcast is sponsored by Stonebridge Press, publishing quality books on Asia for over 30 years. You can find their books at www.stonebridge.com. And while you're there, be sure to check out their recent release, The Thorn Puller by Hiromi Ito, translated by Jeffrey Angles. And I'm your podcast host, Amy Chavez, author of Amy's Guide to Best Behavior in Japan and The Widow, the Priest, and the Octopus Hunter, Discovering a Lost Way of Life on a Secluded Japanese Island. See you next time.